days. So Jeremiah is the prime reason we need to be in this book because he lived in these weird days. And he, as we talked about, we went through several things last week, how uh, he prophesied for 40 years he was a priest that God called to not only be the priest out of Anna, grew up in a priestly family, but called him to be a prophet to the nations. Need to make uh, and be understanding about that clear. He was a prophet to Judah. He prophesied about their coming doom and calamity. And yet he also was given the uh, commission of God to be a prophet to the nations. Now that's why uh, we can look at the prophecies in the book of Jeremiah and realize that some of them are for the future. Some of them were for the present. And certainly he prophesied all the way up until the time uh, Nebuchadnezzar came and burnt the city of Jerusalem down and carried the captives to Babylon. He even preached to them while they're in Babylon. He, he, uh, but but he, ha he said so much more uh, towards the end of the book about the coming calamity and, and then the judgment on the nations that punished Israel. Now tonight, uh, you know, Israel hasn't got that many friends. Uh, America is sort of an unfaithful friend right now. Uh, it, it doesn't want to confess Israel as a friend anymore, although they're a total ally. But uh, they don't want to upset others by saying they're our friend. There's a couple of nations that don't mind declaring that Israel's their friend. But for the most part, uh, and I saw today, Saudi uh, is trying to strike a deal with... Uh, with uh, America in order for them to uh, open up full relations with the Israelis. And basically, the Saudis want a bunch of our military equipment. <laughs> and uh, they said, if you'll give us all of this, uh, these uh, rockets and these uh, missiles and these planes, why, we'll sign an agreement that we'll be uh, uh, open up full relationships with Israel. Hey, if you read the Bible you would be very foolish to believe the Amorites, the Jebusites, the Perizzites, and the Hittites. That's all those people are. And they're still playing the same game they used to play back in the old day. They still got the sand ballot and Tobias mentality. You know, they'll, they'll try to suck you in with foolishness and, and, and uh, uh, ill-fated lies, and then they'll turn on you and do you over in a minute. So uh, uh, Jeremiah's preaching to a time like that. Of course, uh, he is the weeping prophet. Uh, he prophesied uh, to begin with there in chapter number 1. It said uh, in verse 2, To whom the word of the Lord uh, came in the days of Josiah, son of Ammon, king of Judah, in the 13th year of his reign. So Josiah was 21 years old in his 13th year. He, he was made king when he was eight years old. So it appears to me that although he was king when he was eight years old, we know he wasn't pulling the strings of their military when he was eight. So he had some kind of, uh, I guess, supervisor, mentor that helped him make his kingly decisions. But now at 21, he's ready to be turned loose. You see, remember... Uh, a Jewish boy was said to have reached uh, uh, manhood at 12. Uh, that's today they have the bar mitzvahs when they turn 13. Uh, that's sort of be the entry into manhood. And then remember when the Lord Jesus taught in the temple at 12 years old, they were astonished that he knew all this and could answer all their hard questions. I guess it was. They didn't. They wouldn't admit it, but that, they were talking to God manifest in the flesh. He knew the beginning from the end. He, he's the one that created all their truth for their questions. So uh, Josiah is 21, and he thank God he runs into a man called Jeremiah. Now Jeremiah was young when he started preaching. Jeremiah preached for 40 years. But God called him when he was about 
12 or 13 years old. And it says that, uh, and, and all this is information so that you can discern basing on uh, comparing scripture with other scriptures, what time of history was this at? Well, it was somewhere about uh, 20 years before Nebuchadnezzar destroyed uh, Jerusalem. Now, this isn't a Bible folklore. The destruction of Jerusalem by Nebuchadnezzar is not only supported through archaeological artifacts. There are cylinders and prisms that are over 3,000 years old, right at 3,000 years old, that tell of Nebuchadnezzar's feats and what he did to Judaites and to the Jews. So uh, uh, for folks who want to discount the Bible, the Bible is the most accurate history book man has any access to whatsoever. And it, it'd do him well, man, to accept the record and God gives a great record when he gives it. That's why he says, in the 13th year of Josiah. <laughs> and you can find out, when did Josiah come? And then he gives also, in the such and such year of some of these foreign kings, where history has recorded their beginning and their end by the same dates. So uh, the Bible is the most accurate book we have access to. And history is freely flowing in there. It says in verse 3, and it came also, uh, this is the word coming to uh, Jeremiah, God speaking to him. It came also in the days of Jehoiakim, the son of Josiah, king of Judah. Sorry king he was. Uh, Josiah, uh, I think, ruled, uh, I think Josiah ruled about 20-something years. And then uh, Jehoiakim came along, and then Jehoshashin, Jehoiashin, who only lasted three months. But uh, he said, uh, he came in the days of Josiah, king of Judah, into the 11th year of Zedekiah, the son of Josiah, king of Judah. Zedekiah is the last king that there was before the capture. You won't read about another Israeli king or Jew king uh, again, that was it. Uh, the Jews uh, have had not had a king since Zedekiah. Uh, ex the Lord Jesus came, but they received him not. And uh, uh, he will come, and when he comes back, he'll, he'll be acknowledged by every knee and every tongue that he's king of kings and lord of lords. Well, here... Uh, uh, he gives the timeline of Jeremiah. So we know he started under Josiah and he continued to prophesy all the way to Zedekiah, which is a span of about 40 years. And it says, Un uh, unto the carrying away of Jerusalem captive in the fifth month. Well, that was between June and July of 586 B.C. So you say, why is all this important? The Lord put a checkmate on man's denial of the accurate history of the Bible. He always does things they can't, he, he just checkmates them. He tells them exactly when it was uh, and what year it was. And so they, they just, ah, oh, man, I know they get frustrated. I know the archaeologists do. Uh, they, they, the, the archaeologists, for the most part, are pagan, heathen, Christ deniers. I hate to say that, but they are. There's a few saved ones, but for the most part, they're scientists that uh, don't believe uh, much, but they get so frustrated when the Bible literally is proven to them to be absolutely true to the very evidence they hold in their hand. They can't stand it. And, uh, and they're having to deal with it over and over and over again. It never ends. There's something every week, every week something's going on where they got to go, whoa, man, I... Maybe I shouldn't have said what I said 10 years ago about the Bible being unreliable. Uh, it, it's, it's a terrible thing to see men uh, humiliated. And the Bible says that uh, God uh, will, you know, humble uh, those that exalt themselves. So he said, verse 4, the word of the Lord came unto me saying, now, it didn't say uh, a dream or an idea, 
are some thoughts. It said the word of the Lord. So when people say uh, this book, uh, yes, I believe it, it contains the thoughts of God. That's not good enough. <laughs> some people say, I think this Bible's true concerning the ideas about God. That's not good enough. This Bible is the word of God. This is it. This is all we have to go on. And uh, that's why it's important not to belittle it, deny it, or try to correct it. It doesn't work. And he goes on to say, uh, the Lord said unto him in verse number four, before I formed thee in the belly, I knew thee. And before thou camest forth out of the womb, I sanctified thee, and I ordained thee a prophet unto the nations. So, uh, yes, pro-lifers use this. Uh, Anti-abortionists use this as a proof text that uh, uh, the baby is viable and known of God before the baby's born. We believe in the unborn child uh, as being innocent. And uh, we believe that uh, uh, you can't take the life of an unborn child. Uh, you can't take the life of, a, uh, of uh, what they call a fetus. I hate that word. But uh, that little baby that's been conceived. God said, I knew you before you even ever were conceived. Because <laughs> see, he has foreknowledge. We don't have foreknowledge, but God does. And he said, during that time, he said, what I knew about you, I went ahead and marked you for a job for me. Now, that is not totally unusual. In fact, uh, Paul said something similar to that. Uh, I'll read you this verse, if you, uh, but you'll remember what the Apostle Paul said. He said uh, uh, in Galatians 1, uh, he said in verse number 15, he said, But when it pleased God, who separated me from my mother's womb, birth, and call me by his grace to reveal his son in me that I might preach him among the heathen, immediately I conferred not with flesh and blood. So God, when he, when Paul or Saul of Tarsus was born, God already had his life planned out. God already said, hey, I'm calling him to be the mouthpiece to the Gentiles. And uh, he said, hey, once he realized it, you know when it was on the road to Damascus, uh, he said, I, I didn't go talk to men about it. I knew God had called me. So when you run into uh, uh, Jeremiah saying that, uh, it, it just shows you uh, how much we, we never can fully understand the mind of God because it's past our ability to fully comprehend how he got called, and, and John the Baptist was another one. John the Baptist was called before he was born. He, in fact, the angel told his mother Elizabeth, here's what he is, before he ever was born, six months before he was born. So uh, uh, God knows all things, does he not? And even we don't have a clue, but God does. And he's on the throne. Now, uh, Jeremiah was told, as I mentioned last week, the only guy in the Bible that was told not to marry. And what that does, I think, it gives us a picture of what the Lord Jesus warned was going to happen to the Jews during the tribulation. The Lord said the same thing when he, we, when he said, and woe unto them that are with child and them that give suck in those days. And he says, daughters of Jerusalem, weep not for me, but weep for yourselves and for your children. For behold, the days are coming in which they shall say, blessed are the barren and the wombs that never bear and the paps which never give suck. Then shall they say, begin to say, the mountains fall on us and to the hills cover us. For if they do these things in a green tree, what shall be done in the dry? So the Lord warned that there was going to come a day that any kind of family, it was going to be a detriment to you. Now, thank God right now, uh, children are a heritage of the Lord. And uh, uh, blessed is man has his quiver full of them. But, but he said there's going to come a day when you would wish that you never saw a baby because of all the 
tribulation that was going to come upon you. So it was told Jeremiah. God told Jeremiah in chapter 16, don't get married and don't you have any children because there's coming doom. It's coming. And so when you read the book of Jeremiah, you have to read it as its present history. And then you got to read also that some of it is a type of the tribulation. You can't help but get into that, especially the last few chapters of, of, uh, of Jeremiah, which does nothing more than describe the judgment on the nations. And so a lot of things going on in this book. And, and so he goes on and says, look at verse 6, and then said, I, ah, Lord God, behold, I cannot speak for I am a child. <laughs> well, he was at least 13, considered a, he was considered a man child at, at, at the least. But, but he said, ah, I'm not old enough now. Hey, Moses said the same thing. Remember when God called Moses? I can't speak. I don't call on me, Lord. I, my tongue, you know. And here's Jeremiah going, I'm just a kid. Now, most guys his age, you know, we, they use it in reverse. Uh, you know, the mama would say, go do this. I'm not a kid anymore. <laughs> but when you get, when Jeremiah got called to be, uh, to go preach to the nations, he goes, oh, no, no, not me. Look at up. I'm not grown up enough. Oh, Lord God, I'm just a kid. Well, look what the Lord said. But the Lord said unto me, Say not, I'm a child, for thou shalt go to all that I shall send thee, and whatsoever I command thee, thou shalt speak. So God wouldn't take no for an answer. And God also rebuked him for counting himself to be the one who was going to have the capability and the power to do it. Jeremiah had nothing. He was a young man. And he was fixed to face some of the most perilous times known to Jews in their history. It wasn't going to get any worse during Jeremiah's day. It was going to come down, all of it, all their junk they had been doing for two to three hundred years from the days of Solomon all the way to the days of Zedekiah, they had been falsely worshiping gods. They had been going against everything the Lord had told them to do when he brought them out of Egypt. They had been going against all his word and his commandments. They were honoring pagan false deities. And the Lord had continued to warn him, warn him, warn him, and uh, you had all these prophets like Isaiah who came 60 years before him warning them. Uh, you had Amos, another one. Uh, you had uh, Zechariah and Zephaniah. All those people had already come. Uh, Habakkuk was a contemporary of Jeremiah. And he was warning them, you fix to get burnt to the ground. So uh, they were not, they didn't have an excuse but you know what? They didn't care. They had their ball games, their stock markets, their holidays, uh, religious and non-religious, and their houses and their lands and their wealth. And uh, they, didn't, they didn't want to be bothered by a negative preacher. Now, the thing about this, Jeremiah wasn't like Elijah. Elijah enjoyed preaching hellfire and damnation. Jeremiah, it broke his heart to even preach to him. He, he was called the weeping prophet because he saw his nation in disarray and what was about to happen to him. And it crushed him. And then it crushed him to have to get up and tell him, you folks are fixed to burn. <laughs> he didn't want to talk about it. In fact, as I told you last week, he quit right in the middle of it said, I don't do it no more. <laughs> I'm tired of folks being mad at me. See, he, Elijah didn't care if people got mad at him. He provoked them. But, uh, but Jeremiah, he, he didn't, you know, he was, he was might call sensitive fella. Sensitive fella. Well, he said, uh, the Lord told him, said, be not afraid of their faces, for I am with thee to deliver thee, saith the Lord. Now, what would that mean? It's like this. 
when you're preaching and you look out there and somebody's got a negative attitude on their face against you, it tends to mess you up. Uh, I rarely ever look at folks' face when I preach. I don't want to see what. Every now and then somebody will get up and walk out, you know, a visitor or something. Had enough of it. Uh, there's been a couple of those uh, in the last few months where I, I knew it wasn't going well and it got about so far and all of a sudden, gone, you know, out the door. And so uh, uh, you'll find folks sometimes will visit and they think, I don't know what they think they're coming to, but it wasn't what they got. And so, uh, so uh, Jeremiah, you know, being the kind of guy he is, he, he would look and somebody look at him with a negative look or frown at him while he's preaching or going. You know, I had one guy, one guy several years back. He, he shook his finger at me. <laughs> I was up here, mad as he could be. And uh, then another lady, she made it to the service and on the way out, she was there. She goes, every time you point at us, there's three pointing back at you. Oh, my goodness, man. It's a lot of stuff over the years, but <laughs> that's just the way it is. But, I, but God said, don't you let them people intimidate you. Later on, he says, if you do, I'm fixed to intimidate you if you let them intimidate you. So Jeremiah, little old guy, he's under the gun. And God says, get up there and tell them what I tell you to say. And boy, it wasn't going to be pleasant. But did they hearken? Nope. Didn't listen to a word he said. Just like today, uh, and, and, and I say this across the board, if the preacher gets up and says, you bunch of backslidden Christians, you're not right with God, you don't do this, you should do that. If, you had, if there was anything to you, if you had the kind of character that you ought to have, you'd quit missing. You'd quit laying out of church. You'd start on in the Lord. I had a man tell me today, I used to be a deacon at such and such church and I used to do this and I taught Sunday school, but we hadn't been to church in three years. I went, what? I said, what happened? Well, COVID hit. Well, I said, you're here with all these people. Somehow church was too dangerous, but it could be in a public place and that's okay. So uh, anyway, uh, people, people uh, got so lackadaisical that the Christians show up the ballparks with their kiddies instead of in Sunday school. And uh, I remember the days where they didn't have Little League on Sunday morning because the coach would say, y'all go to church now this weekend. Now they say, y'all come to the tournament. <laughs> and they're piled in out there. Well, Jeremiah's message wasn't taken very well, just like it wouldn't be today. And we'll look at uh, his continued call. We looked at his history. We're looking at his call. We're going to look at his commission. And uh, things are developing. A lot of other stuff happening. We've got about, uh, I, I didn't, uh, these big notes didn't work out too well. There's a lot of big old notes there. I spent all that time typing them up and didn't even look at them. And when I do, it messes me up. Have you ever noticed when you look down, you say, oh, I should have just left my train of thought alone. All right. Look forward to seeing you. Appreciate the dinner tonight and uh, hope to see you. Uh, Sunday night, we're having a cookout. Free. That's pretty good, isn't it? Uh, let's bow our heads. Lord, we thank you for the opportunity tonight. Appreciate you blessing us and giving us the fellowship of God's people and your word. In Jesus' name, amen.